1927, with the threat of war in the past and diplomatic relations with Great Britain broken, it became obvious that the Soviet Union couldn't repel an attack, even if it came from neighboring Poland and Romania. For this reason, in 1928, the state approved a program for the first five-year plans. These resulted in the development of their heavy industry, particularly the metallurgy industry, which enabled the start of military construction and the development of the armed forces. So the state approved the program for building large capital ships within the framework, developing the armed forces and military construction. The program of large shipbuilding adopted in 1936 presupposed that in the following 10 years, it would introduce around 530 ships of the primary types into service, with a total displacement of more than 1.3 million tons. Battleships were planned to have comprised half of that tonnage. The funniest part of this was that not a single great country in the world, out of their potential enemies, considered the Soviet Union as an enemy they might battle at sea. That's why they were completely indifferent to anything that the Soviet Union planned to construct. Moreover, one shouldn't forget that the Soviet state was absolutely closed. Everyone was under suspicion. Everything was top secret. That's why the countries of the West didn't even suspect that we were planning or building anything. Soviet shipbuilders based their knowledge of how a battleship of that era was supposed to be on the characteristics of the new heavy ships being built by leading sea states in the mid-1930s. In February 1936, the requirements, specifications for designing a Baltic Sea battleship, Project 21, and a Pacific Ocean battleship, Project 23, were formulated. After revisions of the technical requirements specification of Project 23, it was named as a Type A battleship. In the spring of 1937, when officials of the Soviet Union learnt that the Japanese and Germans had started building battleships with a minimum displacement of 50,000 tons, the Ministry of the Shipbuilding Industry suggested that the design bureau should rework the project without any limitations in a period of three months. In November 1937, Project 23 received its third revision. After 18 months, its final requirements specification were approved, and by that time, two ships were already under construction. The ships should have been built in series, four battleships at a time. The keel of flagship Sovetsky Soyuz was laid down in Leningrad. The hulls of Sovetskaya Rossiya and Sovetskaya Belarusia were laid down in Molotovsk, which is now called Severodvinsk, and another, the hull of Sovetskaya Ukraina in Nikolaev. Performance characteristics of Project 23 battleship, 1939. Length almost 270 meters, width almost 39 meters, draft 10.45 meters, full displacement 65,150 tons. Armor, primary armor belt 375 to 420 millimeters. Total horizontal armor 230 millimeters. Main battery turrets. 230 to 495 millimeters. Armament. Main battery, nine 406 millimeter B-37 guns in three turrets. Secondary battery, 12 152 millimeter B-38 guns in six turret mounts. AA battery, four twin mounts with 100 millimeter B-54 guns. Eight. 37 mm quadruple 46K machine guns. Aircraft armament, four Core II seaplanes. Main propulsion plant, six water tube boilers and three main geared turbine units. Full power, 231,000 HP. Maximum speed, 28 knots. Travel distance, 7,200 miles at a speed of 14 knots. According to the shipbuilding program of 1938 to 1945, approved by the USSR Committee of Defense, the following number of ships were planned for introduction into service. Six battleships for the Pacific Ocean Fleet, four for the Baltic Sea Fleet, three for the Black Sea Fleet, and two for the Northern Fleet. 
What does it mean to build 15 battleships? Can you imagine the required industrial base? These battleships required special factories to produce their ammunition, artillery mounts, machinery, and so on. The entire economy of the country was geared towards this. At the time the ships of Project 23, Sovetsky Soyuz, were laid down, the Soviet Union was suffering from a severe lack of shipbuilding facilities which could hold such heavy ships. For that reason, a factory in Molotovsk, known now as Severodvinsk, was constructed. It had two roof dockyards, which were used for constructing ship hulls all year round. It allowed the construction of ships in the severe north climatic weather conditions all year round. The weather conditions had no effect on production. Quite a desirable novelty in the world shipbuilding industry. The difficulties that Soviet industry had to face during the construction of these ships were unprecedented. Delays in supplying steel for hulls to the shipyards, difficulties in producing armor at the required quality and volume, and most importantly, a lack of skilled specialists. Pre-revolution experience in designing and building large ships was partially lost or obsolete. And as a result, the young Soviet school of shipbuilders had to catch up on the trends of the time, fast. Imagine you're an automobile engineer. You're called to Moscow and then told, today you'll be building not cars, but tanks T-80 or T-90. How would you respond? Perhaps you'd say, but I've never built anything like that. And they might respond, does that mean that you can't build a tank? Are you an enemy of the Soviet Union? A German spy? Now you've been brainwashed. It's neither bad nor good. It's just a fact. Plus, you're a member of the Communist Party. You're a patriot, and you almost certainly don't want to be executed by firing squad. All of those things in combination forced people to work, study, and learn new things. This is the phenomenon of Soviet engineers of the 1930s, 40s, and even 50s. They were working 12 to 16 hours a day. That was a particular Stalinist style, when a boss worked until 8 or 9 o'clock in the evening, and all of their subordinates did the same. What does it mean that you want to go home? Your boss is working. Your boss is thinking about how to build battleship Sovetsky Soyuz. Aren't you thinking about that as well? Yes, you are thinking about that too. The authorities of the country and their armed forces were inspired by the successes of their industrialization, aviation industry, and tank building industry. They were excited about the shipbuilders, who never stopped refining and upgrading their projects, even after they had been laid down. Lacking the necessary experience, searching for optimal solutions required more extensive experiments and theoretical research, which couldn't be always accounted for in the approved terms of the construction program. Everything was in a mess. Specialists, organization, etc. They had no idea how to put all of that together. The structure of the battleship was constantly changing. When engineers began laying down the keel, they were still working out what kind of battleship they should build. Why did this happen? Once again, we didn't have the technology. We didn't have an assembly line for battleships. Technology had moved too far forward, and the Soviet engineers needed to build completely different ships compared to those which had been built by the Russian Empire. Obviously, that introduced some significant corrections into the general understanding of how ships should have looked. To advance their capabilities, they tried to acquire experience from abroad. So the Soviets contacted the United States, France, Germany and Italy. You should understand that it was the 20th century, and no country could build anything in total isolation and without help of other countries. First of all, they needed to research the battleships of foreign countries, starting with their potential enemies, caliber, speed, armor. The funny part was that all of this data was available in open sources. Taking into account the fact that the firepower of any battleship is mostly in its primary guns, the firepower of Sovetsky Soyuz should have corresponded to the firepower of comparable foreign ships. At that time, the largest known foreign naval artillery guns had a caliber of 406 mm. The project for a 406 mm gun had been in development for the needs of the Russian Imperial Navy before the Russian Revolution of 1917. Almost 20 years later, 
Soviet engineers returned to that task. But there was a huge abyss between theoretical calculations and the practical implementation of that gun in its metal form. To cross that abyss, a bridge formed of new plants and production standards had to be built. As you might know, they successfully crossed that abyss. In 1940, the MP-10 test mount was installed at the Naval Artillery Test Range in Leningrad for testing gun B-37. By simply looking at that mount, one could easily imagine how enormous a battleship turret with three such guns would have been. The most outstanding part of the gun was its barrel, which weighed more than 137 tons without its housing. Two blast furnaces were used simultaneously for casting planks to produce the barrel. Then those gigantic cast slabs were forged on a press and processed on a huge bench, but with a length of around 36 meters. In general, it took around a year to produce a single barrel. In terms of being a ballistic solution, the B-37 gun is one of the best in the world. It's inferior only to the 460mm gun of Yamato gun, but the latter has a larger caliber. And the US-made MK-7 gun, with its heavy 1,225kg shells, is better than the Soviet gun in a number of characteristics. Basically, it's the third best gun in the world. Neither the Englishmen, nor the French, nor the Italians had a similar gun. Even the Germans didn't have anything like it. Performance characteristics of gun B-37 caliber 406 mm, gun length 20 meters, barrel and breech block mass almost 137 tons, maximum firing range 45.6 kilometers, initial shell velocity 830 meters per second, firing rate two shots per minute. On June 22, 1941, the Soviet Union stood as the world's largest industrial power they had a colossal number of planes, tanks, and money for due to that. But as soon as World War II started, all of their forces were destroyed on the western border. Leningrad was under siege. Nikolaev was captured, and a pretty significant amount of industrial power was lost with the Mariupol armor plant. It also became apparent that the war wasn't going to be fought at sea, but on land. So all of their forces and supplies were concentrated on provisioning the land front. Thus, the battleship construction program was halted. Despite the fact that no battleships of the Sovetsky Soyuz class were built, their primary armament still found a purpose in combat, even though it wasn't at sea. During World War II, the MP-10 mount was added to Artillery Battery 1, the most powerful artillery unit with the longest range in the siege of Leningrad. Over the time of the city's defense, the B-37 gun fired a total of 185 shells at German positions, destroying several artillery batteries, an ammunition warehouse, and a reinforced concrete command post. During the offensive operation to liberate Leningrad that ran from January the 15th to the 20th, 1944, the gun fired 33 shells. One of the shells hit a power plant building that was occupied by Germans, raising the building to the ground. After the war, the Soviet authorities considered finalizing the construction of Sovetsky Soyuz's hull, but came to the realization that the ship didn't correspond to the post-war reality, primarily because of its AA defenses, but also because of its secondary armament. In addition to that, quite a peculiar thing happened. It was revealed that foreign spies had acquired data about the primary characteristics of the battleship. Thus, in 1949, the ship was sent for scrapping. In general, if we analyze the economic situation of that time, we can say that we couldn't have built 15 battleships by 1946, even at the economic development level of that time. 
But let's imagine the opposite. Assume that nothing tragic happened in 1941, and Sovetsky Soyuz had actually been built. What would the battleship represent if she had been launched? She would have been the most state-of-the-art battleship of that time. These ships could have provided security to the Soviet Union from all directions at sea, and furthermore, fight for supremacy in the theater of war of the seas. One can review the capabilities of battleship Sovetsky Soyuz as a tactical combat unit by comparing her with similar ships being designed in other countries at the time. The only similar ship that was actually built was Iowa. The British Lion and German H-class battleships, like Sovetsky Soyuz, were never built. With respect to her size and displacement, Sovetsky Soyuz was larger than the British Lion and was comparable with US and German battleships. However, she had much better armor than other battleships. Regarding her primary armament, all of these ships were equipped with nine 406mm guns, except for H-39, which should have had eight guns. The main advantage of the guns installed on Sovetsky Soyuz was the higher initial shell velocity, which provided a high degree of armor penetration and firing accuracy at short and medium distances. That's extremely important for the conditions of bad visibility that are quite common for the Baltic and North Seas. Moreover, the firing range of the Soviet guns was greater compared to the guns of Iowa and Lion. Taking into account that Sovetsky Soyuz had been designed primarily to act within boundary waters, she was inferior to other ships in terms of her speed characteristics. When you start analyzing the topic in such a manner, you begin to understand why these battleships were needed and that the country was capable of building them, and also that the design features of these ships fully corresponded to the situation in the world at that time. If it weren't for the war, the Soviets would have built at least a single ship, possibly even two. Two ships wouldn't have resolved any geopolitical situations, but they would at least have been able to cool down some hotheads. Even though they were never built, the Sovetsky Soyuz class battleships greatly influenced the entire scientific, technical, and production base of the USSR industry. Brand new metallurgical industrial sectors appeared, as well as shipyards, and cities were founded in the fields from the resulting infrastructure. The experience acquired by engineers working on the battleship project became the basis of the development of the post-war Soviet Navy. Those people who worked on Project 23 gained confidence in their abilities and bravely accepted the challenges of the new technological era. They went on to successfully create nuclear and guided missile ocean-going ships in the couple of dozen years that followed.